It is the families which mounted this kind of savings, irrespective of the interest rates. You know, in the year 2004, the interest rate of banks on a three-year deposit was cut to as low as 5.5%. But in the year, you can find from statistics, the deposits rose. Because to get the same amount of interest, you have to invest more. Because the interest rates were lower. As a banker, there are people here sitting who will confirm, who will testify to you. The interest rates has never altered the deposits in this country. It may have altered the advances. And for this, the important fact is culture, the tradition, the responsibility a family undertakes. It's no economic unit, but it produces economic results. It's a cultural unit. And now a, a new orientation has been acquired by the West. After 2008 collapse, why did the world economy collapse? It is because the American families collapsed. It is because they have more power. You know in America, today, 66% of the American families own homes. And the amount of money they owe as a debt of it is $10 trillion. And in the last 10 years, if you, uh, 15 years if you calculate, they have borrowed about 7 trillion dollars and the additional housing has been only for 3 percent population. Because the money that they borrowed, they only splurged it on consumption. It was not money to build new houses, it was money as advanced on what was known as home equity and that is what drove the American economy for 5 years from 2006. 2007. And today the American families are around 11, 11 crore families, 112 million families. 112 million families have 1.2 billion credit cards on which they owe 2.5 billion dollars. <laughs> and all this has completely knocked the bottom out of the American. You know that family balance sheet is weak, bank balance sheets are weak, government balance sheet is weak. Only the corporate balance sheets in America are strong, which is not true of Europe. All their balance sheets are weak except in the case of France and Germany. Because you civilizationally disturb the families, their savings and their responsibilities, man one relationship, parent children relationship. With their self, a new culture was produced and the culture produced economic development, I will give it to you. In 2001, in Europe there was a study which was made that the total number of Europeans living in one house was 2.82. It came down in 2000, in, this was in 1990, uh, 1981. In 1995, this came down to uh, 2.5. The result was they needed 10 million more houses. This 10 million more houses meant 3.5 trillion dollar economic growth. And the economic analysis said, you know, you require 10 million more television, 10 million more refrigerator, 10 million more cars. This promoted economic development but see the injury to environment. But still, they did not speak about the injury to culture. In America, the number of persons living in a family was 2.5 uh, to 3.6 in 1946. This remained up till about 1950. Today it is 2.5. This has necessitated the building of 35 million more houses. And this produced a GDP of seven trillion dollars. So you exhaust and erode and destroy your cultural assets and produce financial assets. And ultimately, what happened? American savings have gone down, and Americans have been shifted from bank to stock market. Only six percent of the Americans were investing in stock market in the year 1981, and the rate of interest in America on deposits was 18 percent. And the interest rates were slashed to push the people into stock market. 55% of the American families were thrown into the stock market. Today, the stock
South Korea, America, and national economy are one and the same. This is not true of Japan. Only 9% of Japanese savings gets into stock market. This is not true of Germany. Only 7% of the German, German families invest in stock market. In fact, when German workers were given stock option, only 17% accepted stock options, 83% wanted cash option. Every economy functions according to its culture, but we only think we must function according to the American culture. The Anglo-Saxon culture so dominates our mind, our language, our literature, our writing, our media. With the result, we have created a conflict, a daily running conflict between our movies and our methods. This is the broad conflict I found, distortion I found, inability to manage your affairs according to the factual situation of where you are. You have an imaginary world, you have an imaginary model, you have an imaginary system. And you feel inferior if you don't adopt to that system. And in India, I want to post the IIMs. They have such a trivial opinion about family managed businesses. And they are going to get employed in family managed businesses. And you create a mindset in their mind that family managed businesses are inferior and the family uh, successors are such idiots. They are there because of status. If this is the mindset with which you are going to be executives in the company, what kind of education system you are creating to align with 98.5% of the businesses in India are family businesses? And we have no understanding of what this country is. I asked many IIM people, IIT people, what is the share of corporates in India's GDP? You know it is 14%. Just 14%. And what is the share of the listed companies in India? BSC 500 in our GDP. What is the share of census companies in our GDP? 1%. The stock market has nothing to do with the Indian economy. 39% of the Indian GDP is contributed by unincorporated sector. Non-forming enterprises in India, 43.5 million enterprises, give 100 million employment. You know, if, if I tell you the contribution of uh, this organized sector in our employment, you will be stunned how this country is running. You see, in the year 1991, the public sector undertakings contributed 19 million. This came down to 17.8 million in 2011. In 20 years, the public sector employment reduced by 1.2 million. In this period, the private sector employment, which was about 7.7 .7 million, rose to 10.7 million. That is 3 million it increased. You know in this period the net rise in employment was 10 percent and the population growth was 43 percent. 84 crores to 120 crores. You know 93 percent of the Indians are self-employed. There is no way you can employ India. You cannot convert India into a country of employers and employees. We have no understanding now. How many of us know 87 percent Indians reside in their own houses? It may be hard. Three years ago. Most of us do not know. Our seven lakh villages have only 12,800 police stations. Still, our crime rate, I tell you, it is one of the lowest in the world. For example, the number of robberies in the world per 100,000 population. This is a national master come. This is a completely verified affair. Uh, robberies per 100,000 population, US 146. <coughs> and it keeps on coming down. You know, it's the last country. India with 1.6. Number of people in prison in America, 750 per 100,000 population. India 1.46. But you have a feeling it is an anarchic country. Because J.K. Galbraith, who came to India in the 1960s, he described India as a functioning anarchy. And uh, Karl Marx said, This is a country, oh, it's a great civilization and it has a, a 
uh, village economy where there is no difference between the producer and the consumer, it has the least amount of exploitation. But these fellows worship monkeys. These fellows worship cows. How can a civilization which worships cow and monkey can progress without revolution? So this society has to be destroyed and the British are doing a very fine job of destruction. So it is painful, it is a pleasurable destruction. This is what Karl Marx wrote in 1853 in New York Herald Tribune. And you know the man never came to India, he never met any Indian literature, he never met any Indian, but he influenced India like nobody. And Max Weber, he went to America in the early part of the 20th century and he wrote a book which is fantastic and completely fetal in the Christendom. And he said that Protestant civilization, Protestant Christian ethics can alone build modern capitalism. And he was able to show examples as to how Catholic countries are lagging behind because of their uh, over, uh, overwhelming church, pressure, traditions. And he said that unless the Protestant revolution takes place in Catholic countries, they cannot develop. And Protestant Christian ethic is the foundation of modern capitalism. And I could understand because his experience was that the empirical study showed it. And that was good for the rest. But after 20 years, the man wrote a book on India and China. And he said these two civilizations can never grow because they believe in karma and rebirth. He never knew that these two civilizations were leading the world for 1700 years because that was found out almost a century later. And he believed it. Our sociology was influenced by Max Weber. Our politics was influenced by Karl Marx. And we were not influenced by any Indian thinker. And till today, our think tanks, our education system, our public discourse, and it is also fashionable to quote people who are. Max Weber never came to India. He never read any Indian literature. But he commented on India, and we believe that comment. And it is in that light. Professor Raj Krishna said in 1978, what can we do? We can grow only like this because we are Hindus. He believed it. You know, <coughs> McNamara, as I am a president, he quoted it saying that this civilization will always be expecting aid. And in the interest of India, we have to generate funds for aid in India. In the year 1998, Mantak Singh quoted uh, Robert McNamara to say Robert McNamara said this. Can you believe this intellectual slavery? You know, there is a huge conflict which is going on, intellectual conflict. Unless you resolve it, Unless you face it with facts, unless you understand where our mind has got clogged, we can never do business with pride. You know, I do puja in factories. Have you ever seen that? How a relationship is established between the worker and the machine? You know, in, in 1978, when I had been to, uh, uh, I used to go to Delhi from 1976 and 1978, Ramnath Maika, uh, with whom I had a very special relationship, he asked me a question, Guru, what do you think of Delhi? I said, sir, I was surprised that people here stake the books and put their legs on it and sleep. And they put their legs on the typewriter and sleep. These are all things which you worship. Unless capital is changed, the country has no future. This is what I told him at the time. You know, culture builds a nation. Erosion of it destroys the world. The West is a destroyed society today. 